All right, everybody. All right, since, uh, since I think this is the only non-SketchUp topic in the entire week of shows, uh, I kind of commend you either for being here because you need a break, or maybe it's just a, there's so few people you can catch a couple of Zs before you get back to it the next class. So, so I'm going to be talking about, really, I've kind of titled this uh, Architectural Blogging, The Good, Bad, and The Crazy. It's not a how-to. I'm not actually going to talk about do this and write this and post like this and write these. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to just kind of take you on a journey. It's really uh, about business development and how what we do, whether you're an architect, if you're an interior designer, if you're a contractor, there is so much thirst for what we do as creative individuals and nobody's really talking about it. So when I started doing this, it was, uh, it was 2010. And, and uh, I didn't have any objectives. I was just going to do it because I was bored and the economy wasn't great and I needed a creative outlet. And I just couldn't imagine where it got me. So that's what we're going to talk about today. There's not a lot of people here. So if you have a question, just shout it out. It's not going to throw my wheels off. All right. It's, it's not going to be that big a deal. So if you got it, ask it. All right. Okay. So this is me. You know, I'm right here. Not very exciting. There's, this is all the stuff that per the template I'm supposed to talk about and and say who I am and all the things that I've done. But the, the short version is I'm, I'm a regular person. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds so sweet. Um, but I don't, I don't think that I am particularly unique when I stand in a room full of my creative individual peers. I just did something that they're not doing. That was it. That's all I'm doing. And so uh, I couldn't imagine when I started where this journey was going to take me. So this is a fun presentation. There's lots of really wacky stuff that happens, and I think you'll have a good time. So blogging. This is where it all started, and let me tell you that it's not what you think it is. So shockingly, this is not me. <laughs> right? This guy sitting in what is undoubtedly his parents' basement. Um, trying to figure out, you know, what, looking for his next date, probably. Uh, but when I tell people that I write a blog, this is what comes to mind for them. Me sitting in a wood paneled basement, just praying for the day that I'm going to lose my virginity. <laughs> so this is, this is actually me. Uh, and it was relatively close to about the time I started writing the blog. And I don't know if selfies were a thing yet, but I needed a picture of myself and I don't think I'm particularly photogenic. And, um, I need, and I was, certainly wasn't going to ask somebody to take my picture. So I was on a job site. I'm on the roof of a house. And I balanced my iPhone on a vent stack. And I would hit it. And I'd go run like 10 feet away and try to take the picture. And I don't know if you can tell how big this is, but I'm squinting. The sun is right in my face. You know, and I, it, was, it was a terrible photo, but for some reason, that's kind of how I see myself. Like, not bad, but not quite there, right? So when I started writing the blog, um, what got me to do it was it was 2009 Christmas holiday break. I was sitting with a lawyer friend of mine over the, over the holidays, and he's an attorney who teaches other attorneys how to use technology to do their jobs better, not unlike the purpose of this week's uh, series of classes. So he said something to me that was along the line. I might, this might not be exactly right, but it was basically uh, subscribe to the RSS feed and put it in your Google Reader. I, I didn't have any idea what any of those words meant. I didn't know what a Google Reader was. I didn't know what an RSS feed was. I didn't know any of this stuff. And I think I was like 42 at the time, and I had this moment where I felt I've become stagnant in my creative development. I've settled in, I'm pretty good at what I do, and I just kind of, I'm drilling further down into doing what I do and getting better at what I do and not, not looking to expand my skill set, not looking to try something new. So. I decided, like a lot of creative people's do, people do, when they decide they want to learn something, they just go do it. They don't go read a book on it. You just do it. So that's what I did. So about 10 days later, I had my first, uh, I had my website up and my first blog post was written and it was actually titled, Who Wants to Be Relevant? Me, which is why I started it, okay? So I wouldn't normally consider myself a numbers guy, but since I do a lot of these chats and I go to a lot of conferences, and wherever the world of digital communication and social media are concerned, there's a lot of people that stand up and say, this is what you should do, and I'm an expert. And let me tell you, they're not experts. Everyone's just kind of making it up, and what works for one person might work for somebody else or not work for that person over there. 
So I kind of have this thing that it's important as I stand in front of you to kind of give you a background of what we're talking about and a scale to it. It's kind of like, here are my skins on the wall. This is why you should listen to me when I talk about this stuff. This is the proof that I know what I'm doing. So one of the things I should start off just to put a scale to this is there are, I got some notes, I wrote these down this morning. There are currently over 1.2 billion websites on the internet, which is about a 17,000% increase since 2000. And based on the visitor traffic to my website, it's currently ranked around 114,000th in the world, which that kind of sounds good, but maybe, I mean, 114,000 doesn't sound all that great. So if I told you that that was in the top 5% of all websites, you'd go, that's pretty good, right? Top 5%? That's like A plus range. But the truth is, is it's in the top 99.99988%. That's how high that is. So 114 out of 1.2 billion is really good. How did it get there? Not because of me, but because of the stuff I talk about, which again circles back to everyone who's in this room probably is a creative person and everybody wants to know what you do. Like every day when you roll out of bed and you're like, this is what I'm gonna do today, it's amazing. And people wanna know what that is, right? There's this thirst for what we do as creative people that's not being satisfied. And I can tell you that I know this with absolute clarity because I get buried with emails from people asking me questions and I go, aren't there more people out there that can answer some of these questions? Am I the only one that you can ask this question of? So part of this is me pandering you to say, please start to do this so that I don't have to answer all the emails that I get. So I'm gonna bore you some quick numbers just really, really quick. So. This kind of puts a scale to all this, and, and uh, I can't even really read this uh, on my own screen, so I don't know if you can read it either, but right now, the number of our, I have about 39 million views on my site. And that's not people, that's like articles. So let's say that you go and you read an article, okay, that's a page view. If you read a second article, that's a second page view, right? So 39 million, it's still, that's a lot of articles, right? And then the next one over is the uh, number of posts that I've written. So this is a number that, I've written over a period of just short of nine years, which is a lot. Um, I think the average is about one article every 3.3 days. And I, let me tell you, I hate writing. I hate it. I like talking. <laughs> so if you read, show of hands, has anyone actually been to my website other than like three or four people? Okay, oh, I was gonna make up a bunch of stuff, but. <laughs> People here know what it is. So comments, 24,000 comments on the site. Part of that speaks to the engagement because when I started off, I thought, and I really try hard to do this, if you send me an email or if you send me, a, leave a comment on my site, I'm gonna respond back to it, even if it's stupid. I won't tell you it's stupid. I'll say, thanks for adding your voice to the conversation. Maybe, you know, and I won't say this, but I'm thinking, it might help somebody else out. You know, that happens quite a bit. So. I get a lot of engagement on my site, and it's, the, it's probably the singular thing that I'm most proud of, that people feel they can come in there and they can leave a comment and not be ridiculed and not be made fun of, because that's the thing that most people are really worried about. If you're gonna start writing a website and you're gonna write something, what I learned is everybody's biggest fear is looking stupid. That's, it's not that they don't think they have something that is interesting, they're just afraid the delivery's gonna, they're gonna fall on their face with it. All right, so emails, 36,000 emails. Now think about that. That's like a hundred a day. And you know, I, I try to respond to as many as I can, but it's got the density has gotten to the point that it's really, really hard and I don't do as good a job anymore. And then we have uh, countries. So this, I thought this was interesting. So Google tracks, see if I got this down here. Google tracks 237 out of 238 countries on the planet. They don't do Western Sahara in Northern Africa for some reason. I don't know why that is. It's this little, maybe there's no power in that little country or something, I'm not sure. But someone from each one of those countries and territory has been to my site at one point or another over the period of that. And I think that's pretty remarkable because that also translates into 400 different dialects and uh, languages, which I didn't even know there were that many. So when I write something, it's being translated into other languages by systems like Yahoo or Bing or Google. They're able to plug that in in a translate form. I think it's pretty amazing. Over 30,000 cities, and then backlinks. Does anybody here actually know what a backlink is? Don't feel bad if you don't, I barely do. Okay, 
The short version of the backlink is, let's say that Mark reference, or he writes a blog post and he wants to reference something that I've written. So he puts a hyperlink, which is a, you know, a link that you click that sends you to my site. So those are viewed on the internet as a, it makes you more of a trusted site. So when you have these, that's the internet's way of saying, okay, this is not a garbage site. He doesn't put Justin Bieber words in there just to try to get Justin Bieber traffic and then he bait and switches you to talk about two by fours, right? <laughs> those are bad. People don't like seeing those, all right? So the other thing is all that traffic, what that means from a business development standpoint is, and I wanna see if I can't make this a little bit bigger so I can actually read it. My notes are not so noty, but I need to see the screen. Okay, so what all this translates into when you have a lot of traffic is search engine optimization, or SEO. And the basic premise of SEO is, let's say that you write an article titled, why should you be an architect? And I write an article that says, why should you be an architect? So when search engines try to figure out when somebody types in, why be an architect as their search terms, how do they know what content to put in the search results? And how do they know what order to stack them in? So to grossly oversimplify this, the premise is basically if 10 people have been to his website and 10,000 have been to my website, they'll say, well, they're probably, they're probably looking for what this guy has more than what that guy has just based on the fact that I've got more volume. So what that ends up meaning as you move forward is more traffic equals more traffic. So there's kind of a hyperbolic curve that happens to this. So when people start off in the very beginning and they get discouraged because nobody's reading what they're doing or they're not getting any traffic or they're not getting any engagement, you have to stay committed for a certain amount of time because I can go back and look at the way my traffic patterns work and it'll be, I exist in this realm for about three months and then all of a sudden I shoot up and I get like twice as much traffic on one day and it maintains that level of traffic for another three months. And then there's another bump that goes along. And it has to do with milestones that they read because you get rewarded by search engines for actually generating new content regularly and not having static pages. So let's say that you have a business website and you're like, wow, I haven't put anything new on my website in a long time. That's bad, right? You're actually being downgraded in search results because they see it as a static page. Like maybe you've abandoned it. You know, maybe if they don't know, maybe it's a hobby page and you graduated from high school and you're no longer interested in talking about the Teletubbies. Right, so that get, they get rid of that. So it starts to get pushed down in the feed. So nowadays when we talk with people about if you're gonna have a website, you need to create at least one tab somewhere that you can put new content on it, even if it's a sketch of the day or job site visit photos, something that kind of boosts a little bit of freshness to your site with some regularity. Okay, does that all make sense? I know I'm just kind of vomiting this out, but this is not the fun part. This is the, this is the layer cake, right? We're setting the base right now. Okay, so a little bit about who we are. Uh, not so much who I am, but my office. So uh, we're pretty small. When I, the, pretty much the whole span of the, the history of my website, I have either been a cog in the wheel of a firm or a partner in the firm smaller than eight people, right? Which, when you kind of let that sink that in, I, I have to wear all the hats. I mean, I have a job. This, this is sidebar stuff for me. I write these Sunday nights. I don't dedicate so much time because I still have a job to do, right? And what's really, and this is the thing that if you walk away with one piece of information, this would be one of them. This would be a good takeaway. Digital communication and social media is one of the greatest ways that you can level the playing field. So when I first started, now, and, and this, is, this is still true when you take out like intranets, like um, let's say Gensler has an intranet. And so all their internal traffic boosts their numbers of visitors to the site, which is, it's not cheating, it's clever, but it's not, like nobody's going to Gensler's page because they think they want to hire Gensler to do a new project for them, right? Theirs is about corporate culture, so it's a different kind of animal. But when I first started doing this, within a couple of months, I had better traffic than any other architectural firm on the planet, and I'm one guy, and they have, like, Departments whose sole purpose is to spread the word and do business development for them. And me talking about toilets and why they're gross and why urinals need to be changed because that's disgusting and looks slippery, that's what people want. And it starts to put a face to it. It starts to put some kind of face and narrative to the individual because the other thing I think you should take away with, if you decide to go this route, you need to be a human being. People do not connect with brands, right? 
They don't have, like, I have a relationship with Mark, not with SketchUp, right? Now, I love SketchUp. I'm a big fan. But when I reach out to SketchUp, I'm reaching out to Mark, not SketchUp, right? It's the same thing with any other brand that's out there. You need to be who you are, right? You need to be the face of the organization. Now, you can have multiple faces to the organization, but it can't just be the organization sending out a tweet or taking an Instagram photo. You want it to be from a human being, all right? I think it's really important. So the firm I'm at now, it's 25 years old. I was actually the first employee that the senior partner ever hired right when I got out of school. And I went away and worked a bunch of jobs. And then I've, I've actually worked there three different times. Um, this latest round, I came back and came in as a partner. We're up to 11 full-time employees. And we have, and of those 11, six are licensed architects, and the other five are in the process of getting licensed. And the reason why I included it on this tab is because part of what I do when I do my promotion is I treat my site, I treat my Instagram feed, all my social media. A big component of that is driving culture. It helps people know who we are, what's important, how we go about our day, you know, that we still sketch on trace paper, that we're not completely digital, that we let people get out of the office and go to job sites even though they just graduated from school. You know, so we get people who want to come work for us. So, and I, I, I was talking to a gentleman over lunch, and of our, of the last six hires we have, uh, four of them were valedictorian of their college programs, and that includes Wash U, uh, LSU, Virginia Tech, and University of Texas. Those are all really good schools. And their number one graduate wanted to come work in an eight-person firm in Dallas that doesn't really have an identity for a type of work that they do. I think that's pretty remarkable. And it's because every single one of them had spent the previous three or four or five years reading my website and they knew who we were and what we were about, what kind of projects we worked on, what was important to us, and they knew the culture that they were getting themselves into. Right? It became an incredibly powerful recruiting tool for us, which was not one of the goals. It's a byproduct. Right? Okay. So here's something that you will never, ever see as far as I've been aware of that anyone will ever talk about where social media and digital communication comes into. Right? Show me the money. All right. So I spend time doing this, but as principal in my office and partner, one of my jobs is to sell work. I mean, business development is part of my responsibility. So now I can actually spend time writing blog posts or whatever during office hours. Right? I don't have to do it just on Sunday nights. Ironically, I still do it on Sunday nights because I have work that I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, during the day. So a lot of times I still do it, it's still the same similar kind of patterns. But I thought this might be interesting to kind of show through. So since I started writing the blog, this is what I can track specifically to the blog. Like we would not have gotten these fees had the blog not existed. And that's almost, it's $3.25 million, right? For a firm that was in between five and eight people, that's a lot of money. I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, and that was over a period of 2,168 2, days. And this is funny math, but it's just easier to look at it this way. So that works out to be $1,500 a day, right? Which is, which is not straight up money because part of those architectural fees actually went for doing the architecture. You know, it wasn't just profit margin that we got for me spending, you know, my billing rate's $175 an hour. And if I spend two hours writing a blog post, I can go, all right, my out of pocket to the firm is my $300 times or my $350 times my multiplier for all that kind of good stuff. Well, I can take that off of $3,000 and go, what do I have left to actually do the work in, right? And I can tell you that it works out better. I make more money as a blogger than I do as an architect. And I think I'm doing okay as an architect, to be honest with you. So it's $941 an hour when I actually take the amount of time, because I record it, I mean, I actually log the amount of time I spend answering emails or posting pictures or writing blog posts. I track it because um, I want to make sure it doesn't get out of control. So $941 an hour compared to $175 an hour for my architectural billing rate, right? That's a little, it's a little depressing. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but at least it tells me maybe I'm extraordinarily good at the other one, right? Maybe I'm just okay at one and really good at the other. So... So clearly it's working for, for me. And what is it, and since so many people have read it, you know, the, you know the posts that I write about, but I thought I'd sing out some of the ones that no expert would ever, someone stood up here and said, I am an expert mm, on social media. And you say, I have an idea, I'm gonna write a post about 
being a hooker, architect. And they're gonna, that's a bad idea, don't do that. You're gonna alienate some of your demographics or you know, that's just in poor taste. Or you go, urinals, they're hilarious because they're so gross, right? We need to fix that problem. Nobody would ever let you write those articles. And those are, these are some of the most popular articles I've ever written. I mean, everybody gets those, and, they, and I get comments like, finally, an architect who doesn't have a stick up his butt. You know, I'll take that as a compliment. Um, but this kind of starts to set like how, how I, I take my job very seriously, but these kind of posts let the people who might consider working with me go, when I say we're gonna have a good time when we do your project, they know that that's true, or at least that's gonna be my goal. I'm gonna try to have a good time while we're doing it. But I also write posts that are like this. The ongoing series of being an architect is hell. Which, uh, it is hell, quite honestly. Let me just, it is hell. And it's because of, like, the posts on the left. I, this, was in a, this was in a shower in a, in a hotel I stayed in, and every day I looked at this stupid niche that was set just slightly out of whack, and all I could think of was, who would do this? Like, was somebody not paying attention? And this, every day was this manic, like, what the hell? And then the one on the right was actually my own house, the, the last house I've bought. My wife is incredibly forgiving, and on, you know, we've been married 23 years, and we're on house number seven, all right? And we bought this one house, and I walked into it, and it's got good bones, but it's garbage. Everything else about it is garbage. And even in that one picture, you can see the quality of the paint job, not to mention the color that somebody chose to paint this house. And you go, what are people thinking? Like, that literally looks like someone cut the tip off their finger and finger painted it with their own life force, right? So I talk about that kind of stuff. And then I wrote a post on how to spot a hippie. And when I wrote this post, I was in, I was in France, I was in Paris with my wife. Uh, we'd we had taken my daughter there, she was five years old. And I think everybody had some version of this game when you're traveling. You look and you go, okay, what's her story? And you go, well, she's a broke down mother of three or husband of left. You know, you just come up with some story that's just for entertaining. But we know, you're not really broke down mother of three. That's funny. <laughs> You're just, you're right in my line of sight, so I knew I was gonna get you eventually. Uh, but I noticed there are a lot of hippies in Paris, and I noticed they all look like they're doing badly, right? I mean, they look rough. So to entertain myself, I came up with these rules on how to spot a hippie. I wrote them out, it's hilarious. Turns out hippies are mean as shit, they all have computers, and they've all read this article. <laughs> and so, they, they, they're out of control. I mean, they literally, they say the meanest things, like, you're gonna burn in hell. And I'm like, why would I burn in hell for making fun of clearly what are stereotypes to being a hippie? Uh, I wrote a shower about McShowers. The showers are getting out of control. They're getting too big, you know, come on. Um, I wrote a post on escalation guideline for rat homicide. And you're like, what could that possibly mean? Well, we had a rat infest if an infestation at my house and, we, and I have rules for when you can and can't kill stuff. Like there's a progression and I thought, I told this to somebody, and they're like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I go, I'm gonna write about it, because I think I'm on, I'm on point here. So not only did I write about it, I actually give the rules at which lead up to murder. Like, if you get to number five, murder is an, an option for you, right? You can do it. And then um, the next big thing, if you're six years old, these are these Japanese erasers that my daughter was really into. And I just was practicing the bokeh effect, the depth of field on my camera. Right? And this was at a time when I was writing a lot of articles and part of that creative process was like, okay, it's eight o'clock at night, I need to publish, I need to write and get something done today, I have nothing, what am I gonna do? And you just force yourself to do it. You just force yourself to come up with something. And I wrote tons of really bad articles as evidenced by the last couple of slides that we looked at, right? Those were all me going, I got nothing. I'll talk about killing rats, right? But, it, but almost all of them find some way to cycle back through what it means to be an architect. So when I named my site Life of an Architect, that was my escape route. The architect is because that's what I do. I am an architect, I do architecture. The life is, well I can talk about whatever I want, right? So that's what gives me the latitude to talk about when it's okay to kill something and Japanese erasers are cool, okay? So, uh, I just use a handful of social media platforms. There's, I think at last count, which I did two years ago, there were like 420 something unique social media platforms available. And my advice to you is if you're on this road or you're thinking about going on this road, you need to pick like three. 
because if you are successful with the, with the ones that you choose to go down on, you're going to get some level of engagement, right? You can't have meaningful engagement and maintain any kind of developing kind of platform if you're on 50, right? That becomes that's a full time job at that point, and you're spreading yourself too thin, and you're kind of going counter what the idea is. So, for our profession, creatives, I go. Instagram is tailor-made for what you do. You roll out of bed, you're going to do something, that's worth taking a picture of. We tend to look at things, and I'll speak specifically for architects, but I think this applies for probably anybody in this room. We don't look at things like everybody else does. You know, when I walk into a room, I might look and go, that outlet's not square, right? And there's, there's actually a premise that that's a survival technique, and we're, we're, as creative types, we're more highly evolved because... The idea is that when, when we were ape-like and wandering the fields of the Serengeti, we're programmed to notice things that aren't correct because that's what kept us alive, right? You see all the grass. This grass is moving over here. You're programmed to go, that's not right. Something's happening right there. That's how you stayed alive. Well, we kept that gene, and now it's looking at light switches that are crooked, <laughs> right? So, so creative platforms, Instagram, it's made for everybody in this room. Take pictures of your screen. You do a sketch on your desk. People love that stuff. I, you know, I, I'm not even that good at sketching, and I get people that go, "Amazing sketch," and I go, "You haven't looked as enough sketches." You know. <laughs> so, and I also use LinkedIn. So each one of these platforms kind of reaches a different demographic. So one of the reasons I started using Instagram on the previous slide is because a lot of younger people are using it. Like, it'd be creepy if I was on Snapchat. I'm just not gonna lie. Because that's where all like, you know, like 15 year old people and like younger, they just, that Snapchat is their environment. I'm not going there, right? So Instagram is kind of that transition, you know, and you kind of get younger kids and you can get all the way up to people my age and even older. Um, LinkedIn is probably the most professional platform that I have. Um, but I have a love-hate relationship with it. And part of the reason I have a, a love-hate relationship with it is because of this on the right. And I can't see this. Maybe I can look over here. So if you look on the right-hand side, all those little kind of gray boxes that are stacked up, those are all the things that somebody has decided to say that they're recommending me. Like, this guy knows what he's talking about in this category. And there's like BIM. I couldn't even turn on BIM, right? <laughs> I don't have it on my computer, but enough people have said, this guy knows what he's doing. So I go, all of this, garbage, right? It's all garbage. But it does allow people to track you down and find out what you're doing and what you're involved with. So if I go back a slide, so the right-hand side on this, if, if you're, a, I do a lot of residential work, and I can guarantee you that when somebody decides they want to interview me for a job, they're going to go on the internet, and they're going to find my Instagram feed, and they're going to find my, life, my Facebook page, and they're going to find my LinkedIn account, and they're going to look. And they're going to come in armed knowing what I do and what I don't do, what my civic responsibility is, what my community involvement is going to be. If you don't think people are doing that to you, you're crazy. You're right. It's not the 1990s anymore. So this is something that almost by default needs to exist and you need to keep it current and relevant. But at the same time, you need to take it with a grain of salt because there's a lot of stupidity that comes along with it too. Right? Okay. So then there's Facebook. And Facebook is... For lack of a better way to put it, it's still the 800 pound gorilla. It still drives so much traffic to my site. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things I don't love about Facebook. Uh, it turns out we actually did uh, a house. One of the projects I got through the website was for like the number three guy at Facebook. And this was like house number three for his in Northern Wisconsin. And he's the one who's responsible. And actually what he did for Facebook changed the entire fabric of the internet and how advertising dollars were generated. So I don't know if everyone here looks pretty young, but it used to be before mobile applications became predominant, you had a lot of real estate on your monitor at your desktop. Everyone's going to Facebook on a laptop, on a, on a computer screen. Well, all of a sudden, when that started to migrate to mobile, there's not as much digital real estate for ads. So they're like, well, what do we do? How do we keep that revenue stream coming because we're providing a product, Facebook, for free? So now, if you're just, you know, like my dad, who's on there because he wants to look at pictures of his grandkids, great, that's fine. You're not really who they're worried about. But if you're Starbucks, if you're SketchUp, 
if you're life of an architect, I have around 97,000 people that like my page on Facebook. When I publish something to Facebook, it might go up to 500 of those people. And it depends on the engagement that I get, whether they push it out to in like another 500 or another 1,000 or something like that. If I want to put it in people's stream, I got to pay for that. So they go, oh, for $20, we'll push it out to this market segment and this age group in these countries that have an interest in these categories. I mean, they really, it's creepy. The stuff that they know, it's not personal. They don't know that you're taking a bath at 7.30 in the morning, but I mean, maybe they do, I don't know it, but. But you can pay for pushing your message out, which is something that, you know, a lot of people do, but it's kind of, it's one of those things you take in with the good and with the bad because I got 97,000 people to say, I want to see this content, but I have to pay in order for those people to actually get it, right? Okay, so let's talk about some of the good. What happens when you decide to stick your head up and talk about what it is that you do? Now, one thing that I need to clarify real quick is this is not billboard, I don't advertise. So if you've been to my website, you know I don't show finished photography. And if I do, it's few and far between. I show more mistakes, I show job site photos, I show things that are in progress. It is not our online uh, portfolio. That's what our website's for. You wanna go see the projects we've done and they're pretty beautiful photos, that's the website. This is something else. This is talking about like what I do, how does it work, what's the process, what's the value, what's the culture, that's all this kind of stuff. So I'll say it was a little altruistic in the beginning. One, it was just to learn something. And then it started to feel good because I started getting a lot of attention. And for a while I had this kind of like survivor's remorse, you know, like why is this happening to me? Because nobody really liked me a year ago and now I'm the bell of the ball, right? It was something that was really hard for me to understand because I go, I'm, I'm the same dumbass I was a year ago. And so I, I include this photo just because I get a kick out of it. So the thing on the left was the Texas Society of Architects gave me an award, and it was, it's kind of a big award, but it has to do with the promotion of architecture to the general population, right? And I go, that's really cool, because that benefits all the architects. Anyone who does what, what I do for a living, that helps them. Me talking about what we do and why that's of value, because it's not what I do and how I am of value, it's what architects do and what architects do provide as that it's value. So I got this award, sweet, right? Really nice. The one on the right, I got in 2009, right before I started writing the blog, right? And it was for the Dallas chapter AI, gave me, recognized me as a young architect of the year, right? This is what's important. That was 2009. Just to show you how fast things can change, seven years later, I got nominated and elevated to be a fellow in the American Institute of Architects, which, I don't know if anybody here knows what that might mean. One is an award because you're kind of young, and one is an award because you're kind of old, right? <laughs> and I go, that happened, that bookend happened in seven year window. And it had everything to do with the outreach that I do with the website. Now the website turned into more things, like I do a playhouse competition, and I get people involved globally, and you know, I try to do something, give back, you know, with kind of the, the forum that I get. You know, so many people are gonna come, Let's talk about something good, which is actually part of the reason Mark and I got on the same page. SketchUp has been the most wonderful sponsor and partner on the Playhouse competition for the last several years. And it couldn't have ever been and turned into what it's become without their type of support. And I think that's amazing. It speaks volume of them and a company. And I'm gonna brag on you for just a second. I didn't ask for much. He goes, we'd like to write a check. And I go, don't write it to me, write it to the, to the to charity give them the money, and we'll, we'll work out the other stuff. And he goes, how much do you want? And I said, uh, $5,000. And thinking he's gonna go, oh, slow down, right? And he goes, done, $5,000. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. That'll pay for uh, us to build one of these playhouses. The next year they came back, and uh, he goes, hey, we wanna do it again, but we didn't give you enough money, so we're gonna give you $10,000 this year. I didn't even have to ask. I thought that was like the coolest thing, and it made me go, these are quality people because they're not superficially saying we want to be a part of something good. They're actually proactive. And again, that happened because of the website, something that I could not have foreseen when I started in 2010, all right? So pretty neat stuff as far as I'm concerned. So if I circle back around to me being just a regular guy, once you stick your head up, people find you a lot easier. And that is translated into opportunities that I, no one would ever found me. 
right? So I've been asked to go to Germany and Spain and Israel because I'm seen as an influencer. Now, one thing that I need to make really, really clear is you can't pay me to do anything on my site. I won't do it. I don't do boondoggles anymore. Um, people don't pay content to put content on my site. I don't take any money for any of this, which I think is kind of important, at least for the websites. I don't do it. And if I have something that's of interest, like if I say I like SketchUp and I want to talk about it, I'll do it for free. Right? But the, the flip side of that is if I hate SketchUp, I won't talk about it either. Right? Yes. So how did you get that uh, from people who just read the site and they go, I want to hire you because I like your website. Like that job I got in Wisconsin. That was a $2 million build. Our fee was around $300,000. I don't have a presence in Wisconsin, so how did I get that job? It's because they read my site for two years before they called me and they said, we want to work with you because we like who you are. Right? So that's, so that's how the money is coming in. It's not through ads. It's not, this is not sidebar deals, right? So this is pure, the fruit of the outreach labor, as it were. So this is kind of a screenshot of, I, I end up in magazines and I get asked to do speak like this a lot. Um, and as an architect, I'm okay standing up in front of a room of people and talking. I mean, I'm not gonna die if I flub up here, so I don't, I, that's, I'm not worried about that stuff anymore. Uh, and I get some neat kind of profiles in magazines, and as a result, my daughter thinks like her dad's a celebrity, which is, she's 14 and she still thinks that, which actually might be the coolest thing that's happening right now. My wife was actually kind of mad at me one day because she's like, she's the bad guy. And I go, she's like, you get to be the celebrity. And I'm like, I'm okay with that. <laughs> so does anybody here read Architect Magazine? You know, I think you get it with your AIE membership. So if you know, if, if you write an article or if you contribute to an article, they will do a black ink sketch. They don't use photographs of people. They get an artist and they do a sketch of you, right? And they called me up and they said, hey, we want to we wanna do this thing. We want your contribution and um, send us a photo so that we can have artists sketch. And I'm like, badass. I'm going to actually get my drawing made, right? I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to have it. It's going to be great. So I said, all right. Like I said earlier, I don't think I'm very photogenic. And I didn't, so I don't have like pictures of myself, right? I just, I'm not that guy. So I set up the camera in the front room of my house and I'd hit the button, I'd go run around the corner and I, it took like 20 tries. And even then, I, I'm not gonna point out where, but I did a little Photoshop work on this a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I don't, I look at it now and I go, I, why didn't I dress up for it? I'm, I'm wearing like a woolly jacket and a t-shirt. I go, really, you, you can see where my head wasn't when I was taking this picture. But anyway, so I send this off and they let me know like two months later, they're like, okay, your article's coming out in the next issue. And I'm like, sweet, right? And it's all about getting the picture. I mean, I don't care about the article. I'm like, I'm gonna get the drawing. So I get the magazine. I'm furiously flipping through to see my kick-ass picture and it's that. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I, I look like a cadaver and am I wearing, I have like eyeshadow and lipstick on and really, this is a, it's so bad. It's so bad. All right. So it's cool, but it's not really that cool. Right. Okay. So the bad. Now there is bad. You probably can guess it's some of the bad things that could happen if you have a big digital footprint and you stick your head up and people know who you are. I have a pretty unusual last name. There's not a lot of Borsons in the United States and chances are I'm related to them if you find them. Um, so first bad thing I wanna kinda of go over is hacking, right? So because my site got to be the size it did and it got the volume and the traffic that it did, it got on the radar screen of places that want to either practice the, the viruses and the Trojans that they're putting together or I get brute force attacks, which are called like DDoS attacks. And it eventually just shuts your site down. Because I'm, I'm literally as big as you can be without having full-time support for my site. Because I don't have any interest in that. I didn't do this because I wanted to be an IT person. I don't want to know about coding, you know? And I don't make any money, for, I, know I don't charge money for it, so it's all out of pocket. So I don't want to pay somebody to be on site if I can help it, right? Because that's, that's Bob Borson money, right? So just to give you an idea, and uh, I don't know if you can read this because I've actually, I just, I literally made this slide this morning in my hotel room. So if you look closely at this, this was from seven days ago, right? And over a 40, I think it's, uh, how many minutes was this? 
over, this is just four out of five emails. There were in a 10, and these are 10 minute windows, right? So I get a notification that says over the last 10 minutes, your site has been attacked this many times. So this was from one grouping of attacks, right? 19, 1975, it just kind of goes on and on. And you can look at the timestamp, and I go, this happens daily now. The number of people that try to hack my site, and it's nonstop. And it's, I think this works out, I did the math here. Uh, that's 5,189 attacks over a 40 minute window, which works out to be 129 attacks per minute for almost an hour, right? Certainly, that's not what you're getting into this for. Now, they're not successful, but what it does is, the idea of uh, the concept of the type of tax that they do, imagine it like your website is a house, and the URL you type in, for me, it'd be life of an architect, that's the front door to your house. So what a lot of these sites do, these DDoS attacks, these brute force attacks, they send so many requests to your site that effectively shuts it down. It's like saying, Try to have 10 people walk through the front door of your house at the same time. 10 people don't fit, so as a result, nobody gets in, right? And then I get the emails, your site's down, I can't get in it, right? And I'm like, well, nothing I can do about it. And I'm at work, so it's gotta wait. So the thing that's also kind of a drag to go on that, so I went on there and I just did a keyword search for attack rate, right? Because so, I get a notification every time this happens. If you look at this, this is just over the last 20 days, right? And on the left-hand side, where you see where it says WordPress, and then it'll have a number, or it won't. Do everyone see that? That means, when it says two, that means there's actually two emails. That means one came in and another one came in as part of that same chain, right? So I went in and I opened up every single one of these. And this was just from this year. So I have 107 days uh, that my site has been brute force attacked. And just from this 20 day window, it was 25,047 attacks, right? And I go, that's crazy. The very bottom one on the screen, which is on September 5th, you can see there's a 16 next to it. So that one day had 7,970 attacks over 88 minutes. I go, you just, it sucks. And it's, you know, and it, but it's, if I was bigger, you know, if I had a 50 man firm, I'd probably have an IT guy and they'd probably know what they're doing. I don't, and so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a drag. And then the next thing is emails, right? Which on one hand is cool, on the other hand it's really terrible. So we all get email, yes? Well, nothing other than to, 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 like they could be trying to turn my server into a slave server so they can do something else with it. So it's not a huge, it's not Bill sitting in Chechnya going, lifeofanarchy.com, enter. Ah, lifeofanarchy.com, enter. It's not that. It's, it's automated programs, scripts that are running that send 500 requests to my site in one minute, right? And, be, and my server can't handle that and so it shuts it down. And to why they would do it, I couldn't tell you. That's, you know, that's outside my purview. Maybe it's practice for something else. Maybe they do this to tens of thousands of computers all over the planet and then that's how you end up getting viruses and what you don't know is now they've turned your computer into a slave for them to then start pinging other people. Have you ever gotten an email from somebody and someone else later goes, hey, if you got an email from me, don't open it up. It's not me. Well, they could be trying to do that to my site to get access to it. Now I have stuff in place that stops them from doing it, but the price I pay is it shuts everything down. Like when so many people try, the result is nobody gets in, right? So that's the bummer. So on emails, see where I'm at. I'm gonna pick it up. This is kind of boring. All right, I get a lot of emails. Next slide. <laughs> but let me go to this part. So this was just a screen grab I did, uh, and I had 37,000 emails that were specific to the website. And these are ones that I hadn't had a chance to respond to yet. And some people get a little indignant like, hey, don't be a tool, I emailed you already. And I go, hey, I got 200 emails today and no one's asking me yes or no questions, right? So just on this one screen grab, I highlighted everything that was unique or specific to the website. And what I thought was funny is if you look at the very top one, the, it was from the IRS who wanted me to write a blog post on how to spend your tax refund. <laughs> And I go, 
how do you, I don't want to write that post, but I also don't want to piss the IRS off, <laughs> right? And it, you can look through some of these, life of an architect, I'm an eighth grader, uh, greetings from architects in India. Uh, down at the bottom, um, we have things, should I pursue architecture? I need to join internship, high school course. I mean, these are not simple questions. These are people that are at some crossroad in their life, they either go, I wanna be an architect and I don't know what that means, can you help me? And I'm the only one they can find, right? So I feel a responsibility to answer these emails as best I can. But I, I honestly, I just can't keep up to it. And the result is, you feel like shit. Right? I go, no matter how good a job I do, someone is not just a little disappointed, they're devastated. Not because they didn't hear from me, because they're not getting an answer to what is really a perfectly reasonable question. It shouldn't be that hard to say, I'm thinking about being an architect and I'm in eighth grade. Are there some classes that I should be thinking about? That's a reasonable question. I think we would all agree with that. All right, try answering that question 60 times a week, right? <laughs> That's how I get half the content. I go, I'm gonna write a post on what classes you should take if you're in eighth grade, so I can then only cut and paste a link and they can get an article as opposed to me having to custom write out a response to every single one of these people, All right? But then, oh, I, oh, let me do this. So while I do get some emails that are, that are tragic, the lost and the forlorn, I also get some comments on my site that are just awesome because they're so hilarious. And here's an example. So I got a comment, uh, this guy emailed me, and he goes, hey, Bob, I'm working and planning to open my own firm with four partners, including me, two architects, two engineers. I'm like, okay, let's do this. Let's talk about it. Next question. Could you please suggest a good, impressive, and attractive name of my firm? Okay, so I don't know you. I don't know anything about you. But you want me to name your firm. It actually happens a lot, <laughs> right? So I was like, okay, check. All right, you're starting a firm, you want me to name it, got it. And suggest how we can work together as a good team. I was like, oh, okay. So name your firm and give you like business counseling on how the four people you're partnering with can work together. Okay, okay, let's think about it. And get jobs from clients and other companies. I'm like, so you want me to name your firm, tell you how to work well, and help you get work. I go, am I one of the four architects? <laughs> am I one of those people? I don't understand this. Okay, so those things are wildly amusing to me, but that person thought these were legitimate questions, right? So what do you do? I'm not gonna tell you what I did. I'm gonna leave that up to your imagination. <laughs> so if you go into the internal structure of my site, this is one of the things I pay to, and I have, this is an old, this is an old screen grab just because it serves my purpose and I don't go back anymore. So it's kind of broken up into three categories. The top is, I think it's a monthly average on the traffic I get. The middle is the average per day. And the one is, is specific to an, like an individual day as opposed to like a week or something. And I look at this to see, am I improving? Is this week better than last week? Is today better than this day last week? Is this month better than last month? And I do it to try to spot trends. I can go, do people like reading articles on Monday or do they like them better on Tuesdays? In the morning better or is in the afternoon better? Like what, what's better? It's just observing patterns. And if there's a group of people ever that's good at spotting patterns, it's right here, right? We're all pretty good at spotting patterns. So it's not like reading baseball statistics and trying to come forecasting if someone's gonna get more doubles if it's a Tuesday night and it's a full moon and they're playing a home game. It's not that kind of stuff. But you can tell people go, I like when he talks about design standards. I like when he does sketches. I like when he does CAD techniques, right? You can see what people like and what they don't like. But you can take it too far, like this. So there was a period in time, I'm better now. Thank you for your concern, but. In 2012, I actually wrote down what my traffic was hour by hour. I did this for about a month, just to look for patterns and see now. This is manic, crazy, bad behavior, right? I'm glad I stopped it, because I'd be in therapy if I kept with this. I mean, I might even have a breakdown at this point. But I can control this sort of thing, so I stopped doing it. What I don't have control over are trolls. All right, does everybody here know what a troll is? And I'm not talking about a Norwegian troll, which is what that is, not your troll. So in, just in case you don't know, the, the actual definition in internet slangs is a troll is a person who sows discord on the internet by starting quarrels or upsetting people by posting inflammatory, extraneous, or off-topic messages 
in an online community. All right, I will say, since many of you have probably been to my site, I don't get that on my site, not too often. It rarely happens. And I think it's because there's a culture of, it's a really supportive group of people that leave comments. So nobody says something that is like, that you're an idiot, you're so stupid, why would you ever think that you need to do peer and being foundation when this is clearly needs to be a structural slab? Never happens. I shouldn't say never. It's happened like four or five times. But while I don't, I don't moderate comments in the sense that if you leave a comment, I don't have to approve it before it shows up. You leave a comment, it shows up immediately. But I see all the comments, right? And if I see somebody do something or say something they shouldn't, I go in there and I say, you need to fix this. You need to run up words. If you can't make your comment without insulting somebody else, I'm taking your comment down. Every single instance, except for one, they, they change the wording on their, on their thing, right? I thought that was pretty cool. So, No. We did a we did a blog post last year about um, a woman who is uh, leading a course for other women to learn political game carpentry in Vermont, and just the fact that it was a post about a woman doing something that men do to us, um, we got flooded with troll comments. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I would kind of say don't because then, because if, if you never broach those kind of subjects, like it's not unusual for me to say this or do the stuff I have. And because there's so many comments in the culture is that that's not acceptable. Like I'll have other people who will leave comments and someone else will say, come on, you're out of bounds on this. That's out of pocket, right? And, and, and they're not even like insulting. It's just change the, the tone of the conversation so that it's, it, it's constructive, right? I don't know how I've managed to luck into that, but I, it's really almost predicated by website. For example, on LinkedIn, occasionally I will share some of the more professional articles I write, not the toilet ones, but you know, ones on standards or something, on LinkedIn. And there's this one guy, for years, he just couldn't stand them. And he would come and say, like literally, the, they were really dumb, like off topic stuff. And I'm, I'm blurred out his face because some of you might actually know who this guy is. And if you're active on any of these kind of forums at all, you probably will know this guy. So he ends up leaving these like really dumb comments that are off topic. So here it is, I wrote a post on graphic standards for architectural cabinetry, right? And this guy, I highlight it, he goes, the point of his message, he wants to challenge me to get more clients to hire architects in the first place. That has nothing to do with millwork graphic standards, right? But he just wants to throw some shade my way. Right, and he, and somebody, and I don't know who it is, actually turned his profile pic and put it on a mug, and sent it to me. And I'm not going to tell you what word that I had to block out there at the bottom. But this guy, he's like people in these communities. I mean, they know who he is, and all he does is just cause problems, right? And I engaged him maybe two or three times, and the last time I did, I go, I hope you really enjoyed this because I'm never talking to you again. And he tried so hard to engage me for so long, and I never did it. And now, five, six years later, he actually has come around and he kind of supports, because he's I've been doing it for so long, he doesn't really get on my back anymore. Okay, this is the part, I've only got like eight minutes, so I'm gonna go through this. This is really, this is the money, this is why you're here, right, the crazy, okay? So, I wrote a post about hippies, like I said, they're super mean. So when I wrote this post, some of the comments I got at the top one, it says, you successfully stereotype and outwardly mock, you make silly, substantiated claims regarding vegetarianism and skin clarity, and outwardly mock environmentalism. This is poor written piece of bigotry. And I was like, it's not bigotry. It's a stereotype, right? So, so I, I would sometimes engage these people just to kind of, right? Because I don't like taking it, but then you realize it's so much better if you take it because <laughs> then the dog pile just starts. And like the guy right below says, uh, I really hope karma comes back to bite you in the ass for wasting my time. You, sir, are ignorant, rude, and just an all around uneducated man on this subject. I'm mad I even clicked on this bias article. That's five minutes I can't get back. Thanks a lot. You are welcome. <laughs> right? That's what really gets people. I also don't write a lot of negative pieces on my site because there's enough of that out there. So, but I, I've written two and these are the two. 
And this was a house that was being renovated across the street from the grocery store I shopped to. This one elevation was facing this major intersection. And it was the, just so garbage. This is literally like the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Like every window is slightly different. Only two match. They're all engaging the belt course at the header slightly. This one's slightly low. This one's slightly high. This one's got a couple extra pieces. To, it's really bad. And I really hate glass block. Right. I mean, I re it's the worst building material ever. I'd be glad if it never, sorry if anybody here sells glass block. But. So if you look at the second picture on the left, we know that glass block comes in like square shapes, four by four, eight by eight, and then you can get in two by four, and you go, so what happens when a two by four is going this way and a two by four comes, what happens, right? You get a two by two hole. They don't make two by two glass block. So how'd they solve it? They put duct tape over it, <laughs> right? So I was like, oh my gosh, look how bad this is. So somebody left a comment, and, they, and the, I mean, I don't think I'm wrong here. And he goes, I didn't realize morons like you existed. You are a moron, just to really drive it home. And then he guarantees that I'm unhealthy, fat, ignorant, and decrepit. Go to sleep and die. All right, I was like, that's an overreaction, right, to deduct it. <laughs> so a couple months later, I'm driving by, and they've done some more work on the house. I swear to you, I almost drove into a lamppost when I saw this. So they painted all the brick, which kind of helped mask how wackadoo it was. But you can see that the glass, the tape, the, is gone. They've done something else. This is what they did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote in there, I was like, sweet mother of Christ. Right, thinking, that's funny, right? And somebody wrote, idiot, that's the Virgin of Guadalupe. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So another article that I went, and again, these are those days when I don't necessarily have something I want to write, but I, you know, you gotta, you creative, you gotta force yourself. It's the white paper exercise. You gotta do it. So I don't know what prompted me to do this one particular thing, but I decided I was gonna, I was gonna do a mock analysis of famous architect signatures, right? So I found La Cabousier's, and I, this is complete drivel which I thought was really obvious, because I write things like, it's obvious that the beginning stroke of the L stands for Pelotes, and that the sweeping broad stroke of the C clearly stands for rooftop garden, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't. That's complete garbage. And so somebody came back and said, what a load of shit, <laughs> right? And I go, of course it's a load of shit. And this person says, may I say your analysis of signatures is sophomoric and ignorant crap? You can, because <laughs> that's what it is. It, that's what it was supposed to be. And uh, people don't get it. This, I did the next series of slides for a Valentine's Day post that I wrote, because I was like, Valentine's Day, sexiest of all holidays. And I go, so what happens when people from creative allied industries come together and they have their sexy time and they're gonna have a baby, right? So this is pretty straightforward. I'll go through it quickly. If an architect and an architect get together, what are they gonna have? An architect, right? So obvious. An architect and interior designer? Graphic designer, that's what they're gonna have. An engineer and an engineer? A German engineer. <laughs> so I'm going down this path, engineer and interior designer, statistical improbability, right? I like making fun of engineers because they make it so easy. Uh, and so this person came in, and, and I made all this up, right? This, I made it up. <laughs> so my mom was trained as a graphic designer, and my dad's a, a logger. What are my chances for becoming an architect? 14%. <laughs> right, this person, architect, industrial designer. I'm curious what your thoughts are going to be. Our daughter's only eight months old. Lighting designer, <laughs> right? I mean, this went on for years. <laughs> People want me to tell them what kind of baby they're gonna have. <laughs> All right, these next ones are not that great, but I found it amusing. So I was in a hotel, I was traveling for work, and the secret to whenever I talk about something, I don't write it because I think someone wants to read it, it's what I'm doing, right? So somebody calls me from my office and they're trying to figure out how do I attach this ledger board and bullshit, 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 whatever. And so I, I said, I'll just do a sketch and I'll take a picture and I'll send it to you and we can talk about it because we're both, he's in the office, I'm in my hotel room and we're gesticulating but no one can see us. So I said, well, I took a picture of it. Why don't I just post it to Instagram? And of course, when I post it, it goes to all these different places and push it one button. So what was funny is all these people decided they wanted, the top one just kind of says it all. Take the day off and let Facebook do your red lines. 
Because everybody starts saying, where's your waterproofing? And I go, I didn't draw, this is not a construction detail. This was just to have a conversation. And so people get out of bounds really quick on this stuff. For example, I took this picture and the comment was, how funny is it that nowadays with Revit and some of the software, I can put like the actual picture in and it takes no more effort on my part than putting a wrong picture in. And I go, this level of detail, it's mind boggling that you would do this. And so uh, the guy at the top again sets it off. Oh dear Lord, when will you learn not to post pictures like this? The thing that I love so much is the second one goes, how is the pendant hung? There's no ceiling rose. Right, like that's the thing that holds light fixtures up is the cover. <laughs> and so I try to explain it and I go, well, the roof is sloping away and so the actual, the cord's actually like eight feet further and you're just not seeing it. His response was, mm, not so sure. <laughs> I know, I know I'm right on this. Yeah, right, it's, oh my God, they're like, it's gonna fall down. Right, so stupid. So here's another kind of creepy thing. Uh, so I get my, pers my, my persona gets stolen for romance scams more than I care to admit. And I'm not really sure, like I said, I'm not sure why this is digitally all that welcoming. So I found out that if you're not friends with somebody on Facebook and they send you a message, Facebook tends to route it in like a junk mail folder. And I didn't know about this. And I learned about it after doing this for like three or four years. And I was like, what, there's a secret inbox? So I went to it and I opened it up and oh my Lord, the things that I found, People are sending me naked pictures. And I go, what is, architects are not that sexy, right? I don't have to understand this. And so this poor woman, you can see what she wrote here, and there's an escalation to this. So she's like, this is Linda. I, 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 do you know, do I know her from dating service Badu? I don't even know what Badu is. And she goes, please return, return an answer to me. And then I get another message. Have you been talking to me on Messenger? Please reply soon. I'm very worried about you. Why are you not messaging me and let me know you're okay? Right now, I didn't see these come in. Like, I mean, they all showed up. This I found them like a year after all this happened. Right? I love you, sweetie, very much. Kisses. So clearly, the relationships to going somewhere. Baby, I need to talk to you. Kisses. You know how upset I get, sweetie. Please don't worry. Message me, please. Are you there, sweetie? Where are you? I'm missing you. Please message me. Why have you removed me? For see, things are turning. <laughs> Right? Because apparently somebody got whatever he wanted from her, which is probably some money. And then it says, why did you delete all your messages to me? You're ignoring me, I know you are. And I thought, oh my God. And the next message was, I'm outside your house with a knife. Right? <laughs> and this kind of stuff is kind of creepy, right? And the thing is, is I got messages from her kids. And one of them was like, hey, I'm at the airport, can't find you. You know, and I get people calling me saying, my mom's on a fixed income, you need to quit asking her for money. And I go, oh, I'm, not, I'm not the guy, right? So, uh, I only have like one or two more slides, and I, I think what I'm gonna do is, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up, because I think I'm, I'm over my time as it is. Just a couple minutes, you took too long to introduce me. <laughs> so, uh, without telling the, like, the amazing summary that I put here, I'm just gonna say that everyone in this room can do what I do. I honestly believe that. You may not do it exactly the same way I do, because you're not me, and you may not have my personality, but, you can talk about what you do for a living. You can take pictures of what you do for a living. You can take construction photos. You can take before and after. You can talk about the culture of what we as an industry do. And that has so much value. You know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm just a regular guy, right? I had three goals when I graduated from college. One was I wanted to make $100,000 a year. And I graduated, I made $21,000, right? So that was an uphill climb. The next goal was I wanted to have my work published in a history book which that's a big goal. I since modified that to just getting it published in like magazines. And the last goal is I wanted to buy a jet ski. I, know I still haven't bought a jet ski for what it's worth. But I'm just a regular person and you can see that I've reached literally tens of millions of people, just me. Can you imagine if five more people did this? 10 more people, 100 more people? How many more people would be interested in what we do as creative individuals? So I'm gonna call it a wrap there. Thank you, this is that last slide. Here's a platypus playing with an egg. There was a great story about this and I'm not gonna tell you. And then <laughs> there's my email address. There is all my stuff. I'm gonna stick around, so I know we need to clear the room, but if anyone has questions, just come up and grab me and we can chat. So thank you, appreciate the time. <laughs>